Hello and welcome to Insight. I'm Antoine Ninli. Coffee is Ethiopia's black gold. Consumed around the world and pouring in over $800 million in export. But more than a stimulant, coffee has a deep connection with the culture and people of Ethiopia. Stay with us as we travel to the highlands of Ethiopia and explore the rich history and social value of the world's favorite bean. It's one of the most widely consumed beverages in the world. Coffee is the hot drink of choice for many. The passion for coffee goes back centuries ago and is now grown around the world. In fact, there are several countries claiming to be the birthplace of coffee. But as we look at historical literature and trade routes, the origin of coffee leads us to East Africa. Coffee, as we know it, particularly the Arabica, is a product of Kaffa. Even the name coffee comes from the name of Kaffa. You know it? And the way we can prove it, in Brazil, they cultivate and grow it. Isn't it? But in Ethiopia, it's a natural forest. You get it in the jungle. You go down to Kaffa, you just look up, pick the coffee, and go. Over 1,000 years ago, the coffee plant originated in Ethiopia. Today, Ethiopia is the fifth largest producer of coffee in the world. With revenue over $800 million in export, coffee is a central part of the livelihood and the economy of Ethiopia. From the beginning of the 9th century, coffee is exporting to outside the world from Kaba. Here in the Chawarda, the place called Mankra, coffee first traditionally started from this. And the spread in the world, even in the coffee Arabica, is the original place is here, here in the Chawarda. And from this, coffee is spread in the different worlds. From Ethiopia, coffee spread to Yemen and then to Egypt and North Africa. By the 16th century, it had reached the rest of the Middle East. By the 17th century, the popularity of coffee drinking in the Muslim world spread to Italy, then to the rest of Europe. And by the 18th century, coffee made its way to the East Indies and to the Americas. I was invited to a traditional coffee ceremony by the village elders here in Kaffa. And what makes this interesting is that they use coffee in bamboo cups, which goes way back to the 9th century. But the only problem is, how do I get there? Uh, excuse me, can you give me a ride to the village down below? It's really a short distance. Well, I guess I'll find another way. She doesn't show you Dusha, Kasha, Amom, Digiso, Nagide, Ethemona. Socially, we use the coffee for everything. For example, today is Sunday, and for complex management, for complex resolution. We are discussing before eating everything, we solve it with drinking coffee with complex solution. And for inviting guests and for everything, we are using coffee. Coffee is a part of our life.
So we just had the uh, interesting ceremony in Kaffa, but I must say that my experience was very different and unique. We had uh, kocho, which is from the false banana plant, and aib, which is like the cottage cheese. And I will say it's the best cottage cheese or the best aib I've had in Addis or Ethiopia. And this, I will say, is very interesting. This is uh, from the false banana plant. Um, in Ethiopia, the word tissue or napkin is known for as soft. But this is what they use for soft in kaffa. It's traditional. It's what they used in the old times and what they use today. It's kind of similar to the international brand of baby wipes or hand wipes. Very fresh. It's something I think I will take back to Addis Ababa with me. <laughs> Before leaving Kaffa, I traveled to Mekera, the last cloud forest of Ethiopia. It is here where coffee has grown wild for over 1,000 years. I'm in the highland Kaffa. I was invited to meet with a farmer who lives in this area. As you can see by the mud on my shoes and pants, it's very wet. We just made it after the morning rain. And obviously I did not wear the, white, the right shoes for this, but I've come this far and I must continue my journey. Falling a few times and bitten by ants, needless to say it has not been a very luxurious journey, but a journey that I think is important to see and to experience just how a farmer may live in the highland lands of this, this area. It is a coffee forest and kaffa and with the wetness and the climate makes it a perfect uh, way for coffee to be grown here. I finally made it to the village where the farmer lives. I've traveled through the forest. Uh, it rained earlier today. I even stepped in a puddle of water, slipped a few times, bitten by ants, but I finally made it. Dakna Hachatne. I might give it. Ashabar Alamayo and his family shared with me what coffee means to them. It's very difficult for me to compare it. It's where, where in the world I say it is my life. There is no substitute word for that. We are much dependent on the coffee. Even during harvest season, it is a family effort. For Ashabar and his family, coffee is essential to their livelihood. Rich in coffee history and traditions, Gemma is one of Ethiopia's major coffee producers. Once arriving in Gemma, I was welcomed by a local farmer and his family for a traditional coffee ceremony. 
Coffee ceremony we make three times morning, afternoon, and the evening. At the ceremony, we talk about social issues. The problem of the village, if there are disparities, we settle it. And if there are common problems, we also try to solve it during the coffee ceremony. Like many coffee farmers in Ethiopia, for Abafira Abasambi and his family, coffee is everything. Coffee means everything to us. It is what we eat. We buy uh, grain by selling coffee. We also send our kids to school from sales of coffee. Our clothes is also bought from sales of coffee. In Ethiopia, there are various coffee unions and cooperatives representing farmers in their respective coffee regions and zones. For Abifira and his family, joining the Aromia Coffee Farmers Cooperative Union made a difference in their lives. The benefits we are getting is a lot. To tell you some of the benefits, before we join the cooperative, we need to sell our coffee in the calm home to traders. But now, through selling to cooperatives, we are getting a second payment or dividend. From this dividend, we are using to manage our field and also to buy what we need. Owned by organized coffee farmers cooperatives in the region of Aromia, Aromia Coffee Farmers Cooperative Union was established in 1999 with 34 coffee cooperative societies, representing over 22,000 members. Today, the number of cooperatives has grown to over 190, representing more than 200,000 farmers, with the main objective of improving the lives of the farmers and their families. The need for establishing came from the problem of the farmers. In 1999, farmers faced a serious problem of uh, uh, dropping coffee prices in the world market. And uh, many of uh, the farmers who were organizing cooperatives were not paid by uh, coffee exporters. And most of the cooperatives lost a lot of uh, dollars unpaid or burr unpaid by the exporters. This is what brought Oromia in place, just to bypass uh, the private traders and uh, process the coffee directly and export to the foreign market. As you have seen, farmers have got the possibility of selling their coffee without uh, uh, going to the middlemen. So they are paid a fair deal, a fair price, for the coffee which they are delivered to their cooperatives. In addition to that, each individual farmer receives a dividend, which is 70% of the profit which the primary society is getting back to the farmer who delivers the coffee, based on the amount of coffee he delivers. Again, after uh, processing the coffee at the primary cooperative level, they bring to the union, and the union exports the coffee abroad and it brings back 70% of the profits back to the cooperative, and the cooperative pays back 70% to the coffee farmer. So this has enabled the farmer to send their kids to school and to get uh, enough uh, diet for their families and also to build good houses for their living. Wow. 
The Romos are making burakala from the dry bunny coffees and started this maybe one more than 1,000 years ago. Uh, and the Romos used to expand this uh, in all regions of Romia. But this culture is now left to the Guji in the Taborans. And in the northern part of Romia, meaning the central shore and the other places, they only do this when they do have uh, marriages or some cultural ceremonies. Otherwise, in Borana and Oguji, Bunakala is always experienced by uh, the communities. Very buttery, crunchy, very different, very different. Before ending my journey, I had a chance to visit a local school that was built and supported by a Romia Coffee Farmers Cooperative Union. Ethiopia produces 400,000 tons of coffee beans a year. Half of that is consumed for domestic consumption, the highest in Africa. There was uneven power between the suppliers and the exporters, the buyers. Uh, the payment system was very, um, uh, let's say, ineffective. Then there was a lot of contract failure, uh, a lot of blank checks that were written uh, to suppliers, and then those suppliers couldn't pay the farmers. So there were no numerous instances in the rural areas where people actually committed suicide because they didn't get paid uh, because of these blank checks uh, that the buyers were, were sort of allowed to do. Um, so when the exchange came about, you know, we said, we're all about integrity integrity of the product. We're going to grade it um, and ensure that the quality is what it's supposed to be. We have a warehouse receipt system so it's not being sold off truck like in the auction system. It's delivered into a warehouse and so the exchange takes the responsibility of delivering it to the buyer. Uh, we set up a transparent trading system where the prices by grade are you know transparently sort of announced to everybody in the market including the smallest farmer in the country uh, and then the, f the fourth thing that we do is, is the clearinghouse a very important function so by taking payment from the buyers transmitting it to sellers the next day after trade by 11 a.m. basically we got rid of this whole payment default that used to be really a big uh, issue in the coffee trade we have a push and a pull technology uh, the push is in both real-time and in discrete time. So in real-time means that in less than two seconds, we're transmitting whatever happens on the trading floor, the prices that are discovered through the process of, of you know, bidding and offering for the commodities. We transmit the prices as soon as you know, a handshake happens and the orders are filled out. Uh, then those prices are put up on the screens, of course, here on our trading floor for everybody to see, but also simultaneously to 32 uh, rural displays, which are outdoor electronic boards <clears throat> that can be seen by anybody in the market. So now you find that people are standing outside the boards, in fact, you know, sometimes holding two mobile phones, you know, relaying those prices that they're reading off the board. So that's one, but of course not everybody's near a board. In addition to those boards, we also transmit uh, in real time to our website. We currently get more than 2,000 hits a day from about 107 countries around the world. So transparency is not just also within our our own domestic uh, borders, but also globally. The biggest creditor, the biggest lenders in Africa are not Standard Chartered or Barclays or Citibank. It's the small farmers. They typically sell on credit and uh, they'll, you know, the, the, the local trader will say, well, I don't have any cash now. 
come back next week when I sell your the coffee or whatever they bought. And then, you know, in the meantime, they'll, they'll flip it a few times, have the farmer keep coming back two, three times, you know, months sometimes on end. And then when they get paid, the trader might say, well, prices went down. You know, the price I told you we'd agreed, that doesn't hold anymore because, you know, guess what? Prices went down. What is the farmer going to say or do? So they're always at the mercy of, of this situation, and it's a very risky environment. So when you live under that kind of risk, typically your behavior is very risk averse. You don't plan on making big investments. You're not going to go buy a new farm equipment. You're not going to you know, invest in sort of a, a, an extensive land creation that you have to pay people to help you to do because you don't, you're not sure if you're going to get paid. So when you have a system that guarantees you payment, then the way you invest in your own productive capacity changes because you're assured that there's a market that's giving you returns. Our core business is um, roasting uh, pure Ethiopian coffee from different regions. So when we started business um, almost 58 years ago, we started by showcasing different region coffees for tasting it for a lot of people, uh, for different kind of customers. Um, and we still keep on doing that now. Uh, we provide the best Ethiopian coffee, roasted, ground, packed. Uh, that makes it basically unique. People come together. You get together, it's a group of women, sit down, chatter, chatter about anything under the sun. And it's just a way of kind of healing ourselves and letting whatever is in our mind out while having coffee. It's a culture. Definitely is completely different than the U.S. where you take coffee, let me wake up in the morning, I can't breathe if I don't get coffee. In Ethiopia, it's you enjoy it. I actually see a certain trend within the young people that um, I remember I used to laugh at my mom whenever she'd have her friends over and have coffee and say, oh my god, these women are chattering all over again. But now I see it because me and my friends, my friends invite me to their house for coffee. And it's such a nice thing to know that I generation after my father or my mother go to my friend's house to have the same thing. Perhaps not as dolled up as it usually is with, you know, the, the grass and, and the incense and all these things, but there's still that culture of coffee that's taken up by the younger generation. There is, um, for the higher qualities, absolutely a brand for consumers. Um, we need to develop the consumer base to like that sophistication of coffee. Um, and we should absolutely get the best value we can for those coffees by selling it as an Ethiopian-specific coffee. But, and that's what we're doing today. But there's also opportunity to use it in blends, to use the different grades, to really go in and try to stratify the different qualities uh, coming out of Ethiopia so we can buy more and more. In my work with Fair Trade, that's what I like to do. I like to have a community where we can buy 10, 20 containers, because that's when you can really see change happening on a farmer level. Coffee is the backbone of the Ethiopian economy, generating nearly half of the foreign currency earnings that this country obtains from agricultural commodity export. From the $2 billion US dollar exports earnings of Ethiopia in 2010-2011, 842 million USD are from coffee. Price of coffee in Ethiopia, it rejuvenates us. 
It allows us to trace the origins. It reminds us of the traceabilities and it reminds us of the importance that coffee has not only to Ethiopia but to Africa. <laughs> It's good to be in the birthplace of uh, coffee. Since as we took our machinery, we have been dealing with the Ethiopia market more than 20 years. So this is not a new thing actually, but this organization and this show is uh, bringing you for more opportunity to meet with the professionals, especially for the coffee and coffee lovers around the world, especially for the Africa. Many Korean people, they like African coffee, especially Ethiopian coffee, very famous in Korea. This concludes our program. I'm Antoine Minley, and from all of us from Insight, thanks for watching.